Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for everyone for coming. Uh, tonight, as you know, we are going to be starting the first half of our series on 1 Samuel. So we're kind of doing the whole book through the year, but we're doing it in two massive chunks. So this is the start of the first chunk, and then the second chunk will be at the end of the year. Um, so tonight we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 1, and then into a bit of chapter 2, down to verse 11. One of the striking things about these first couple chapters is that the rest of the book will really be continually calling us back to themes we see in these two chapters. You know, sort of like whenever you have musical themes established at the start of a symphony and then those keep repeating through the rest of the time. Apart from anything else, the two books of Samuel are an amazing piece of literature. You know, Robert Alter, who is a Hebrew expert, has said about these stories that the major sequence that runs from 1 Samuel 1 to 1 Kings 2, which is the David life story, is one of the most astounding pieces of narrative that has come down to us from the ancient world. So that should be enough to sell it. And I would really recommend that you try to read at least some of 1 Samuel for yourself over the next few weeks as we're looking at it. The book is full of good stories, has King David in it, so there's plenty to enjoy. As we start the book tonight, we're going to find that for a book that will take us to kingdoms and battlefields far and wide, it seems to start in quite a mundane setting. The story will start with a young woman from the Israelite countryside who longs to have a child, but is barren. There may not be a more universal experience for humanity than to have a deep longing for something, but for that longing to remain unfulfilled. I would say that for each of us tonight, probably that situation doesn't seem very strange to us. That situation isn't very far from our minds. It isn't uncommon in normal life, but it's also not uncommon in scripture or even in this book. In a sense, you can think of the whole of 1 and 2 Samuel or even the whole of the Old Testament as being focused singularly on this theme of unfulfilled longing. Even after David ascends to the throne, the book is always looking forward, always pointing to the next fulfillment of God's word. The ultimate completion of the story never really comes. So before we get into the text, let me start by asking this. What is it in your life right now that you deeply long for, but that you don't have? Is there something that you've been asking for from God for months, maybe years, but that you don't have and don't seem any closer to having right now? Maybe you long for a more stable job or marriage or reconciliation or forgiveness or friendships or children or something else. All of these things I would say are pretty universal human longings. And while they can become enslaving, none of them are invalid in and of themselves. All of us want these things in some way, yet often we don't have them. So we must then ask ourselves the question, what should our response be to unfulfilled desires? What should we do about this? Before we get to answering that question, we have to each ask ourselves, like with regard to these kind of unfulfilled longings, why do we want these things? Like, why do I want that job? Why do I want that relationship? And it's so important to ask this because, as we will see in this chapter, even if those are perfectly valid things and natural longings for us to have, the reason why you want something will have a big effect on how you respond when you don't have it, when your longings go unfulfilled. So we need to think about that tonight. So tonight we need to think about why we want what we want, in a sense, what our motivations should be, and how we can have the right motivation. So let's read now in 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. There was a certain man of Ramathim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Ziph, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. 
And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you've made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli, and she said, O oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. And that's all we're going to read for the moment. We'll come back to the start of chapter two later on. So this chapter of Samuel obviously starts with the story of Hannah, the circumstances she finds herself in and how she responds to those circumstances. The books before Samuel, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, all start with deaths. But first Samuel starts with a birth story, already pointing us to themes of like new life and new beginnings, which will continue over the following chapters. The story opens with a man who has two wives, Hannah and Peninnah. One of them has children and the other doesn't. We're then told of how every year they would go up to the tabernacle at Shiloh, where God's presence dwelt, and offer their sacrifices there. And at that time in particular, Peninnah would provoke and irritate Hannah about her barrenness. And we talked about this like in regard to the book of Ruth last year, but it's really important to remember that in this culture, children aren't just important in the way they are important to us now. At that time, children were the whole future of your society. If you didn't have kids, then you had no future. No one to work, over, no one to take over the work, take over the land, no one to care for you when you're older. It would have been a source of great pain and shame to be barren. Not to mention the fact that all the way back in Genesis 1, God had commanded his creatures to be fruitful and multiply. So it seems as though Hannah isn't fulfilling the mandate. Penida provokes and attacks Hannah about this. And on the other side, her husband, Elkanah, simply comes to her and says, basically, you shouldn't be sad. You've got me. I love you. Isn't that enough? So these are the two voices Hannah is hearing, and neither of them satisfy her, so much so that she takes her pain elsewhere. She doesn't give in to the draw of either making her life revolve around how many kids she can have, or on the other hand, she doesn't let it revolve around love and romance. And in many ways, these are two of the biggest potential idols for us today as well, kids and relationships. And Hannah doesn't take the bait. In fact, in verse 9, we're told that after the sacrificial meal, Hannah rose up. And according to Hebrew experts, this is actually an idiom, best conveyed by our idea in English of putting your foot down. So that's what it means, really, when it says Hannah rose up. It shows a decisive shift in the scene. As Hannah instead turns and brings everything to God, in verse 11, pleading for a son and promising that if God grants this request, he will be given to God for all the days of his life, and no razor will be used on his head. Eli, the priest and judge of Israel at the time, sees what happens and thinks Hannah's drunk before he's corrected and then affirms what she's vowed. Very important to note that having been sad before, Hannah is now no longer sad, even though she doesn't yet know what the outcome of her situation is. That's really important to note. Following this, God is indeed gracious to Hannah, and having prevented this before, now gives her a son whom she calls Samuel, saying, I have asked for him from the Lord. 
She fulfills her vow, and after she has weaned him, Samuel is indeed brought to Eli again at the house of the Lord to live and serve there. In Hannah's words, to appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. So the chapter ends with Samuel being given over to God in this way. So the question we have to ask is, if this chapter makes a really big deal out of Hannah's response to her circumstances and where that led, then what was so special about her response? Why was it so special? The answer, I think, lies in the question of ownership, okay? A few years ago, when I started working for PwC, my first project involved working to do a lot of background checks on companies, finding out like where they were based, who their directors were, and things like that, so that we could know, basically, if it was safe to do business with them or not. And one of the most important things we had to find out about these companies was the ownership. Who owned them? You know, sometimes it was easy enough. They were massive companies on the stock exchange, and you could get the information without much difficulty. But other times, they were much more secretive, and the information was harder to find. There are many countries where you'd find that like politicians or other public figures owned large amounts of these companies, which for us made them really high risk, because that increases your risk of like corruption and things like that. But the point I'm trying to make is that ownership is important in terms of how you treat people and things. Who owns something affects how you see it. For us, some owners made business more risky, but think about it on another level. Like if you're at someone's house and they hand you a family heirloom telling you that this belonged to their grandfather and has been in the family for generations, you're probably going to be careful how you treat that thing. And you're not going to treat it the way you would treat something like an old cloth in your own house. You're not going to throw it around because somebody else owns it. It doesn't belong to you. It isn't for you. It's for them to have and to enjoy. You treat things differently depending on who owns them. The problem for us as human beings is that without thinking about it, sometimes we can almost have a tendency to go through life with the assumption that other things and other people basically exist for us. We tend to treat the world as if it exists ultimately for us and for our pleasure. And so when frustrations come, we're left confused and bewildered by these things. Why can't people just do things the way I want? Why can't things just go right for once? It's almost instinctive for us to think this way. Even with people, we can sometimes live as if this is true. You know, we basically look on people as if they're there to meet our needs and there to do what we want them to. So when they don't give us what we want from them or they cause problems for us, we can't deal with it. Now, this is true in any sphere of life, but it is especially true in the area of parenting. Now, I have to caveat this by saying, obviously, I'm limited in what I can say because I have zero children. But think about it this way. If you go through life with the impression that your kids ultimately belong to you, then you will inevitably put expectations on them that they aren't meant to bear. You will often impute your own desires to them, wanting them to fulfill not, your, not their own dreams, but your dreams for them. You may even project your own insecurities onto them and feel disappointment as you see flaws crop up in them that you see in yourself. In the end, if you see them this way, they will probably end up feeling a lot of pressure to perform and they won't have any real sense of security. This is the result as if we treat kids as if they belong to us. And apart from anything else, it will lead to constant disappointment or constant pride in us. This is the case, especially in the parent-child relationship, but it's also the case in any relationship that we would put weight on. You know, romantic relationships or even friendships can fall under this trap where we end up being like excessively controlling and distorting something good. And this would have been the result for Hannah either way if she'd listened to Penina or Elkanah. She would either have felt worthless due to her inability to have kids, or she would have relied on Elkanah's love and just increased the bitterness in the household, constantly firing back at Penina about how Elkanah loves me more. Neither of those two options would actually have solved the problem. And yet what Hannah actually did in response to the situation not only transformed her and her family, but it was the trigger for a national transformation as we will see in the following chapters of Samuel. Hannah says in verse 11, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. Hannah turns the whole situation upside down. She stands up, she puts her foot down and says, actually, I do want a son but I don't just want a son for me so I can get one back on Penina or for Elkanah so he'll be happier and love me more. I want a son for God. I want to have this child so that he can belong to God and serve God's purposes, not mine. 
This was totally transformative. And this is the attitude that we must display at the same time. We have to learn to see each and every person not as belonging to us, but as belonging to God and ultimately existing for him. When you see everyone around you in your life as belonging to God, as being like a gift from him in your life, it will prevent you from using everyone around you as a vehicle for your own ends and desires, which is our natural tendency. For us to see people as belonging to God means seeing them as being a means for him to achieve his ends. And not only that, it's actually the best way to love people. For us to love anyone means seeking the very best for them. And look at what Hannah's desire is for her only child in verse 22. But he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. That should really be our highest aim for anyone we come into contact with in our lives. Like how much would it transform your interactions with people in your everyday life if this was your ultimate desire for them? That they would dwell in the presence of the Lord forever. How would it change the way you interacted with them and the way you thought about them? This is a totally different trajectory of life and a far greater desire both for ourselves and for others than simply wanting an easy life. Dwelling in God's presence is literally what we were made for, as we were thinking about this morning. If we bring it back to parents, as in other spheres of life, there are basically two ways you can parent a child. You can treat them as if they belong to you and are there to serve your desires, or you can treat them as if they don't belong to you, but instead they belong to God and exist for him, for his desires and purposes which will inevitably be better for them anyway. The only way you can truly love a child or anyone in a sacrificial way is if you see that they don't ultimately exist for you, but rather for God. Following each of these two tracks will lead to vastly different outcomes. Now, this is kind of a spoiler, but the movie's been out for ages, so it's really your fault at this point. Um, in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, which we were watching a while back, the story goes that the main character, a spaceman named Peter, is reunited with his biological father after having been separated from him for years and raised by these guys who are like space pirates. By one man in particular who was like an adopted father to him. And when he meets his real father, he's very happy at first, especially when he sees that his father is this like cosmically powerful being who can create entire planets. And his father invites him to join in his work, which eventually turns out to be a plan to take over the galaxy, mostly by destroying it. And the main character, his son, Peter, refuses because he doesn't want to harm his friends. But the father won't let him go because the only reason he wanted to be reunited with him was so that he could help him take over the galaxy. And in the end, Peter and his friends figure out a way to defeat his biological father. But Peter and his adopted father, one of the space pirates who had raised him since he was a kid, are trapped on the planet they're on as it's exploding, with only one space suit between them as they have to escape. And in this dramatic scene, Peter is saved as his adopted father straps the last spacesuit on him and sacrifices his own life to fly Peter to safety. Now, it depends on how you feel about superhero movies. But to me, this was a really powerful image of the two ways you can parent a child. You can treat them as if they belong to you, use them for your own ends, and ultimately destroy them and yourself. Or you can treat them as if they aren't ultimately yours and die for them, in a sense, loving them sacrificially, so that they can really flourish and live more freely, doing for them what God has done for us. To truly love a child or anyone means handing them over to God. He loans us kids full time for 18 to 20 years, but they really belong to him, not us. And loving them means handing them to him. Like this is kind of the point of parenting to an extent, more than having, just having good kids, it's about showing God to your kids. And to do that, we must treat them as his property. Hannah shows us how to think about children, in contrast to bad examples we have of this later in the book with Eli, Samuel, and Saul, who all cause problems by holding too tightly to their kids or binding up their hopes too much in, in their children. And it's not just true for kids. These principles hold true for all relationships. We must learn to hold all the people in our lives loosely. You cannot control either your own life or your kids' lives or anybody's life for that matter. It isn't possible. And when you try, it will end up in disaster. We must not cling to people in a needy way, trying to control them or expecting more out of them than they can give us, but instead treat them as if they belong to God and acknowledging him in this way as the king, as the ultimate owner of all. So to go back to the first point, the way we respond to unfulfilled longings will depend on why we want the things we want. If we long for something only for ourselves, for our own ends, 
We risk making the thing itself, whether that's children, money, job, house, security. We risk making those things ultimate, making them the controlling power in our lives. If we think of all these things as if they ultimately belong to us, then conversely, we will end up belonging to them and being enslaved by them. If we think this way, then our unfulfilled longings will drive us mad. We won't be able to cope with the thought of not having the things we want. So how can we exhibit the pattern that Hannah shows here? Well, we could start by praying something along the lines of this. God, my heart desires this thing. And I know that I want it partly just for me. So help me to want it for you. And if it pleases you, give it to me so that I can use it and enjoy it for you and for your glory. But if not, your will be done. How much would it change us if we thought about things in this way? Earlier on, I highlighted the fact that Hannah's sadness is gone, even before she knows what the outcome will be, even before she knows if she will have a son or not. Why is that? Well, it's because in wanting a son no longer for herself, but now for God, she has freed herself from enslavement to her own desires. She's taken the active step of reorientating her own heart and redirecting her desires toward God and not herself. And this has totally set her free and given her peace because now her highest priority is no longer that her prescribed desires would be met, but that God's will would be done. And she knows that it will be done whether or not he gives her a son. And that, and, and that because it's all in his hands, he will do the best thing for all his people, regardless of what that looks like. An attitude like this will totally set us free when we find ourselves in a space of unfulfilled longing. If it belongs to God, then we can be free. In this space, our worship of God seems, ceases to be simply ritualistic, as it is with Elkana in this chapter, just constantly repeating the same sacrifices, constantly showing up at Shiloh every year. With Hannah, that worship has reached the heart. And as she hands her child over to God, that is an act of ultimate worship to him. But after everything that's happened, the question now remains, why was Hannah able to respond to her circumstances in this way? What did she know that enabled her to do this? And how can we learn to respond in the same way? To find the answer to this question, we need to read in chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Because what you have here is a poem, which is really a song of praise by Hannah to God in view of what she knows about him. She's outlining what God is like, how he acts in the world, and what the basis for his action is, which is the truth that enabled her to act the way she did in chapter one. So let's read now in the start of chapter two. Chapter two, verse one. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. In this passage, Hannah doesn't actually mention anything about herself or about her son but rather praises God and outlines the way in which his salvation works. He lifts up the weak and brings down the strong. He fills those who are empty. He makes the poor rich and lifts up the needy because the pillars of the earth belong to him. The point is simply that like Hannah, if we are to be in line with God's plans, we need to learn to be weak. The biggest obstacle 
to God's work in our lives and through us is not our weakness. It is our lack of a sense of weakness and a lack of a sense of need of him. Things that were programmed into creation from the start, as again, we were thinking about this morning. We need to sense our weakness and then respond to it in the right way, in the same way Hannah does. Look at what she's doing here. In both chapters one and two, she's responding to her own weakness and inability, as well as the pain that that weakness has caused her, by reminding herself actively of the truth about God and living within that truth. She's preaching to herself here that this is who God really is. He takes the weak and gives them strength. He takes the ugly and makes them beautiful. He takes the empty and makes them full. I think if we're honest, all of us can relate to how Hannah felt. In some way, all of us can think even now of unfulfilled longings and weaknesses we have in our lives. Things that we wish were different about us or different in our circumstances. Maybe we wish we were better looking or we were smarter or we were richer or we were as productive as other people. Like I have really enjoyed looking at this chapter and, and its implications because I personally find myself to be a very weak person. <laughs> like I've lost count of how many times people at school or university or work have told me off for being too quiet. <laughs> I've been told off at work for looking tired. And even now, I still struggle often with a sense of inadequacy when I see other people doing lots of things for God, like evangelism and church planting and mission and I know that I can't really do the exact same things that they're doing. This often creates feelings in me of being less than, of being too weak, of not being good enough. And I'm sure that you can think of similar things in your own lives. And yet what this passage, I believe, is saying is that people like that are the very people God wants. They are the people he chooses. They are the ones he wants to work with so that it can become clear that he is the savior, not me. He is the holy one, not me. He is the rock. At best, I'm just like a shell that's stuck to that rock. A jar of clay holding a treasure, as Paul would put it. You know, it's amazing how almost every time I've been in like an SU group or a team of Christians for some club or something, almost everybody in the group is an outsider in some way. Like we are not the popular kids at school. We are not the best and most successful. Very often we're the weirdos. I can remember having a conversation with Stephen one day on the way home from work, where we were both chatting about this principle that God almost seems to specifically choose and welcome the losers of society. He picks the people for his team that no one else would pick, in a sense. But this is the truth. This is just how God works. This is who he is. Look how Hannah ends her song here. She says that God will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now that word anointed comes up quite a few times throughout Samuel. And as you may know, in Hebrew, that word is Mashiach, Messiah. People question how this word came to be used for the first time in the song of a poor Israelite woman before any such anointed one had been raised up by God. And I, I can't give you an answer to that. Maybe it was prophetic in her part. Maybe there's more going on in the background that we don't know. But either way, Hannah is saying here that in an ultimate sense, God's way of working with people will be shown um, through his chosen anointed king. And as we go through the rest of the book of 1 Samuel, we will see how the author of the book very carefully shows us these principles, um, repeating themselves time and time again, the principles laid down in this song. As the strong and the proud are broken and fall down, and the weak and the nobodies are raised up to positions of power, just the way Samuel is here and David will be later on. But there's more. As we know, David was not the ultimate or the final Messiah of God. David, in a very real sense, was chosen out of a position of weakness and nothingness to be God's king, because God determined him to be a man after my own heart. But as the books of 1 Samuel go on, we learn that the end result isn't so much David as it's David's son, who will be the true anointed one, the true savior of God's people. The Greek equivalent of Messiah is Christ. And so in the very first line of the New Testament, we are told that this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of David. And as we look at the life of this new Messiah, we see once again the same principles worked out 
and famously sung about by his own mother in the Magnificat in Luke, which is very, very similar to what we get here at the start of chapter two of 1 Samuel. He's born as a nobody in a provincial backwater, with some people probably assuming that he's illegitimate. He's poor, he's a carpenter, and yet at the same time, he's anointed by God at his baptism, he's declared to be the king, and he has authority over power and strongholds. Yet this same Messiah, at the climax of the story, is seen not in power, but in a position of total weakness, hanging from a wooden cross in the sky, in shame, and seemingly in defeat, not in power or victory. And far from calling down legions to save himself then and there, he dies, and that seems to be the end of it. But there's an interesting aspect to what Hannah says here about giving strength to the Messiah. You know, similar, word, similar wording about giving strength is used elsewhere in the Old Testament to denote new life. And so, with the true anointed one, having died in weakness and shame, God does indeed give him strength, raising him from the dead and seating him in a position of power, not just over Israel, but over every might and power and dominion and every name that is named. Strength out of weakness. This is how God works. This is his salvation. And through what Christ has done, he has given to us, weak, hopeless, destitute sinners, an eternal strength and eternal riches beyond our wildest dreams. This principle of God's salvation is something that we see worked out in all of Scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you're in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So how are we to respond in view of this? Well, we need to learn to be weak, by which I mean that we must learn to not to hold tightly onto what could be an alternative source of strength for us, but to instead to hand these things over to God as an acknowledgement that it all belongs to him anyway. Christ begins his descent, as we learn in Philippians 2, by not holding tightly onto his position, even though he was God, but by letting go of those things that were rightfully his and becoming weak. And in a very real sense, Hannah does the same thing by asking for a son not to hold it over her rival, but so that this son can belong to God. In his commentary about this book, um, Robert Bergen makes a great point when he says that in this passage, we learn that true power is to be found not in one's position in society, but in one's posture before God. The way to have true power is to let go of it, to become weak, to give it to God to acknowledge that everything comes from him and to treat all that we have as being his. This is the path to true strength. So what is it in our lives that might be an alternative source of power for us? Our money, our relationships, or maybe especially our kids? What do we feel tempted to latch onto as being our source of strength and hope? God says, don't cling to those things. Learn weakness, hand them over to me and find true strength. And Hannah was able to do this because of what God is like, because he only ever operates on the basis of grace. He must, because it all belongs to him anyway. Every act of God toward us since the founding of the universe has been one of generosity. All that we have is his. We ourselves rightfully belong to him. And if it all belongs to him, that means that he can only ever relate to us on the basis of grace. Literally everything is a gift. We don't even exist without God's initiation. We are totally dependent on him. Like I was trying to think of a way to convey the importance of this principle and the effect it should have on us. And this is where I got to. I think most of us live as if grace is more or less the way an advert I saw recently described it. Saying this, grace cannot suffice without total effort on the part of the recipient. And grace is an enabling power that allows men and women to lay hold on eternal life and exaltation after they have expanded their own best efforts. And there was this picture, like presumably of Jesus, and he looked like he was sort of standing at the top of a mountain, holding out his hand, sort of ready to lift you up. Like, does that sound right to you? Is that what you think of when you think of grace? As if it's like 
available to you only when you've done your very best in the first place. Like, I think more or less many of us live as if grace is like us. And we have this image of God at the top of the mountain, sort of watching us climb up and shouting like encouraging slogans at us or something. That is not the way it works, okay? That is not the picture the Bible paints. In fact, the picture the Bible paints is not us climbing up the mountain to God, but God coming down the mountain to the bottom to then strap us to his back and to climb back up, okay? He carries you. He doesn't just wait for you like on the next ledge. He carries you from the start to the end. In Isaiah, he says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb, even to your old age, I am he, and to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. I will carry and will save. That is what grace is. All the effort, all the load on God's side, not ours. The people he condemns are not those who cannot reach the next ledge, but those who refuse to acknowledge that they can't reach the next ledge. Those who refuse to be weak, who refuse to give it to God and to let him do the heavy lifting. Your flaws and weaknesses are never your greatest enemy as much as your tendency towards self-reliance, towards trying to overcome those things yourself. Your weaknesses and your shortcomings are not an obstacle to God's plans and purposes. They are the means by which God works out his plans and purposes. Like I heard a sports coach say this in something I was watching recently. What's in the way becomes the way. What's in the way becomes the way. That is kind of how it works with God. Whatever you feel is in your way, whatever you lack, whatever weakness is impeding you, that is not an obstacle to God. It is the way in which he wants to work out his plans. The biggest obstacle you think you see right now is maybe the main way in which God wants to reveal himself to you and through you. None of what Hannah says means that success is somehow guaranteed for the weak either. But it is saying that for us to get on board with God's plans, we need to become weak. We need to see all that we have as his and to treat everything and everyone as belonging to him. There's no need for us to ever feel less than on the one hand or proud on the other. I remember Tim Keller saying that it isn't just that God likes underdogs, as it were. The point is that the pillars of the earth are his. It all belongs to him. And so he only ever operates on the basis of grace and generosity. If you do not have strength for something, it is not because you're unworthy. And if you do have a particular strength or ability for something, it's not because you're more worthy than others. It's simply because God chose to give or not give that strength or capability to you. Note in this chapter, God does not give Hannah a son because she prays the perfect prayer. There's no reason given for why God gives Hannah a son. He just does because he chooses to. If there were any other reason, if it had in some way depended on her, it wouldn't have been grace. Everything belongs to God and he gives it to whomever he chooses. Therefore, not thy might shall a man prevail. This is who God is. This is how his salvation works. Many problems arise in the rest of this book for Saul and others due to misconceptions about God, as indeed they do in our own lives. But this is showing us the truth. God is a father to the fatherless, a friend not of the self-righteous and powerful, but of the lowly, contrite, and humble. God only ever operates with human beings on the basis of his grace because all that exists belongs to him. The only appropriate response from us is to learn weakness, to acknowledge that everything is his and to let him use whatever he's given us, little or much, to work out his plans in and through us because he is the king and our only savior. As one of my favorite verses in the Bible says, the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, it is he who will save us. Let's pray. Father, we just want to give you thanks for what you are like, as revealed in, in your word, as revealed in this chapter. Father, we tend to believe that you're not like this. We tend to believe that your grace has to be somehow fought for and is only really available to us when we have already done good, have already done enough. But that's not the picture that you paint in your word. So, Father, just make this more real to us. Make yourself more real to us, Father. Help us to live in the light of this truth and to treat others in a way that, that, that you call us to, really, as, as seeing them not as being there for us, but as being there for you. So we just give thanks, Father, and praise you for who you are, um, as we give thanks for all these things. In the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.